because I have good training from all of my colleagues. Um, one of my most famous colleagues in research is a guy named Rich Sutton, who's an American trying to discharge his American citizenship so he doesn't have to pay taxes in two places. Um, is uh, the, one of the things you see in the popular media is us versus them. You can think of it as robots versus humans. Um, and for real AI researchers, it's not about that. It's not about trying to use AI to build um, human capabilities. As far as I know, we know how to build humans, right? That's a task we all understand, more or less, right? Um, so good AI scientists are not trying to replicate or build humans. We're trying to understand intelligence, and that's part of what Rich says in this evolution in this way. So why we claim Amy is a global leader in machine intelligence, let me ask you a question. This is the professor asking you questions. This question is for Americans. Um, where do you think the best AI in terms of scientific impact is done um, in research uh, in the United States? Boston. Any guesses? Boston. Sorry? Boston. Nope. City but that's. City nope. Berkeley? Nope. It's it's good that you don't get it immediately because mm -hmm. it says something about. In the AI pandemic of everything we see in our newspapers in all languages around the world, uh, it's not always easy to identify the source of where the scientific outcome comes from. So you'll see in a slide a little bit later is that the most productive scientific group in the United States with respect to AI and machine learning is Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Mm. <clears throat> so the reason that I want to tell you about that is because nobody takes Canadians seriously unless we have some measure to show you what we do. Um, and I'll show you that measure later and you can judge for yourself. You'll, you'll be able to judge even better when I tell you about frontiers of research. Now, remember I said I'm an academic scientist. These slides were prepared by a professional slide preparer, communications person inside of Amy. The slides I will show you next are much more exciting for me. but. But, but, but the reality is, is that we know we have to be able to, to deliver content to a spectrum of people all the way from, like when you talk to Antonio about Health City, I talk about in precision health from bench to bedside. We have to do the same thing with our research in artificial intelligence and machine learning. We have to be able to anticipate line of sight from what the eureka moment one of my postdocs might have in the lab tomorrow all the way to what it means to capitalize that and create return on investment. And this academic scientist is not so much concerned with return on investment, otherwise it wouldn't be working at a university in a public university. Um, but we are concerned mutually with the impact, part of which return on investment creates. So there's, um, I'll say a little bit more of this. Um, so this slide is from the graphics designer, this slide is from the academic. Um, one of the things that you may not know is that, is that Canada was the first country to declare a federal AI strategy. And this is just a list. It hasn't been updated because the person who updates this is a science journalist who hasn't done it. But fall, last December 1st in Germany, Angela Merkel at the yearly digitalization summit, digital summit, created Germany's um, AI strategy. What's really interesting is that uh, there's a whole other talk about AI strategies around the world, is that you can see that lots of people, lots of federal jurisdictions are interested in capitalizing on this. This is, you know, if you were working in a, a, in a cloth production factory running mechanical looms in the 1880s in Britain, um, this would be the same kind of thing. Who has a, a federal strategy for using Jacquard looms to produce stuff faster than your competitor. It's, it's something like that, but it gives you some kind of picture that way. Now, when you talk about, you'll see another version of this. So this is, oops, this is a version of, I think I put an animation in it because Canadians are, uh, I'm sorry for showing you our ranking because it's embarrassing to be so high. That's, I'm sorry, I'm Canadian. Um, the most important thing is I can find a ranking to make anyone look high in a ranking. So. 
I am absolutely the tallest person standing and looking in that direction in this room right now. So we know how to create measures, right? We don't create these measures. These measures are created by uh, one hopes an arm's length organization. The most important part about this ranking, as you can see, so um, MIT ranked six, that's pretty good, right? But most Americans are not aware that we're ranked higher than MIT in terms of scientific output and capacity. But the most important thing I claim about this slide is this second list, is that the investment of China in AI has leapfrogged one of our competitors in that sense of scientific production, Tsinghua, who's at MIT of China, a leapfrogged in four years, has leapfrogged ahead. And, and it took us 15 years to get to number two. Now we're number three. And we're investing even more money than we ever did before. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. But anyway, that's... Uh, um, I always tell uh, my Canadian colleagues that being ranked 16th isn't so bad. That makes them second in Canada. <laughs> I'm from the west of Canada. You know about this rivalry, right? Um, where's Montreal on there? They're not on this list. They're below 16. They're actually, I think, about 21. Not so bad. And remember, these are rankings of universities. Right? So um, um, Vector in Toronto, Mila in Montreal are made up of McGill University and University de Montréal. So um, that will give you some idea. Now, uh, what I want to do is to give you an explanation, as far as I can understand it, about how the any not-for-profit company has set up its own divisions to be able to take what the researchers do and contribute to the industrial development that might help entrepreneurs, investors, businessmen understand a line of sight from what we do at, in scientific research that gets cashed out in technologies like open source code, for example, all the way to um, investments. And there's four divisions which have been cleverly named. Amy explores, connects, innovates, and educates. And I want to briefly tell you a little bit about those um, to give you some idea. This gives you something of the pan-Canadian strategy. So in this stylized way, you can look at each of these components and see where things sit. Um, the, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research is actually a registered charity. It was created in 1982 by a medical researcher from McMaster University who got really weary of the tedium of public funding and peer review. So he said he's going to raise a whole bunch of money and pick particular topics to invest in. So CIFAR was created then. It's been one of the grand clearing houses for investment to AI. So that's its role. It's kind of like um, investment agency, but it's investing both um, charitable contributions and public monies into research programs. So it sits there as that kind of coordinator. So I won't, I won't belabor this kind of thing at the moment. But one of the things that's interesting is this number at the, at the top, 125 million isn't very much money. Um, but put this in context, the President of the United States recently announced something about encouraging investment in AI. And many of the AI people around the world said, oh, well, now, isn't that impressive? What's not impressive is encouraging your, invest, your public investment agencies like NIH um, and NSF to dilute their budgets from where they're being spent now and focus instead on AI is not a new investment. This is a new investment, and the 125 million goes only to three places. And it's only for building capacity. The Canadian government has another billion dollar exercise in super clusters run by industry, which are to exploit AI. So this is a large investment for three research groups in the country. And they're thought to be the place worth investing. This makes it a little clearer, right? So you can see from this picture just where places are. Somebody put animations on that too. So there's essentially three places in Canada enjoying and sharing that 125 million to build capacity in Canada. And our job is not to do industrial development. Um, Amy, the, the company not-for-profit, its role is to take public and industrial investments to convey and transport, if you like, in medicine you talk about translational research, 
to industry. We do have really, dive, go ahead. Just a quick question. With yeah. the CIFAR dollars, are yeah. those uh, distributed evenly through the three institutions, or is it more based on uh, project-based merit? So uh, I wish it was distributed evenly. It, mm -hmm. as, it, as it turns out, when, when CIFAR and, and, and the federal um, government Department of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development did their assessment of AI in the country, they didn't know we were ranked number two in the world at that point, right? And so, just like you find um, a proliferation of groups around Washington enjoying the fruits of the lake uh, that don't fall too far from the tree, the same is true in Canada. So of that 125 million, um, I think it was split 40 million, 40 million, 30 million, with us getting 30 million, um, and the rest invested in um, AI and ethics and some federal programs. So no, we didn't get, if you, if you look at the rankings, we didn't get our fair share, but we're changing that now because now that AI is um, front and center, it's um, a little, little bit more obvious what, what we can accomplish. So the list of things that we do are here. I'm gonna talk about some of them later on after in the second presentation. But we have lots of expertise, and our expertise covers the full gamut of artificial intelligence. Um, I, I read a, um, uh, uh, what, what read like a funding, uh, a VC pitch from a small company recently that says, we do the full scope of AI, including both deep learning and reinforcement learning. Okay? And so if you think that's the full scope of AI, that's a sign for an investor. Is <laughs> let those guys fail on their own, not with my money. Um, these are the photos of the 17 people that are part of our research. So if you look, up, if you look all of these names up, um, I think, See, that's the oldest guy in the group. Um, and let's see, so he's a survivor. She's the youngest one in the group, Martha White Reinforcement Learning. But all of these people have their own independent notoriety in the AI world, so you won't go to any AI conference and not find some of these names, any AI conference. So our diversity is, is truly quite amazing. And I would love to tell you it's by careful planning and strategic thinking. As an academic scientist, I can tell you it's people, it's pure dumb luck and circumstance in some cases, right? Um, there are lots of things that we've accomplished that you can point to. I'll say a little bit more about those later. These are some of them, and I'll say something about them in the, in the second half hour that you will indulge me with. But the reality is we have lots of people who have engaged outside of our group to make a difference in the world. So. Um, for example, you may not know that two of the biggest R&D investors on the planet um, I'm currently working with. Um, the biggest R&D investor by most measures is an American company called Amazon, which you may have heard of, right? Yeah. Um, the second largest investment in R&D on the planet is not Alphabet. It is, you might not know that. It's the Volkswagen Group. So I work with the Volkswagen Group, and I work with the sixth largest investor in R&D in the world, which is the Huawei Group. So these are absolutely huge companies. Right? And, and while the Volkswagen Group is run by a bunch of engineers for the most part, they still manage to produce 11 million cars a year. When I work for them, I say, you know, you wouldn't miss one, would you? <laughs> that Lamborghini has my name on it. Um, <laughs> The point about this is that, is that a few, a subset of these 17, do out, go out and engage in industry. So I've been a CTO of a German software company. Uh, my favorite German word, anybody speak German? No? Oh good, then you'll love this word. Aufsichtsratsvorsitzender. So I've been an Aufsichtsratsvorsitzender too. Chairman of a board of a company. Um, so we get out, and, and that's the trickle of thing that I think is important to a research investment community. Uh, many people hire and we work with many of our relationships. So the, um, Jimmy said that I was responsible, in fact, two years of discussions with um, uh, Google and DeepMind to be able to get through the legal details of creating the big first DeepMind lab outside of London. So um, endurance is something that all entrepreneurs and investors know about. The, the explorers part of that pillar of Amy is really us. It's the researchers and the researchers who choose to engage 
industrially because uh, you can train an academic scientist to understand what a business model is and what a return on investment is. You just have to slow them down long enough to get them to hear all of the words and be curious about what they mean. Um, so how do we do this? It's, as I said, working with companies. By the way, you might want to know the academic scientist's opinion about automated driving because I've worked with two of the largest groups doing automated driving on the planet, which is Volkswagen and Toyota. They just seem to be bigger than all of the other companies doing this, so I can tell you some stories about that, but right now I won't. Um, we also know in that 125 million, we have to invest in education. Um, and that's never been more important than now. The AI pandemic has created a lot, a lot of half experts. Clever investors and entrepreneurs know how to avoid talking to somebody who can say AI deep learning and blockchain all in the same sentence. Right? It's, like, it's like the old days, if you had a ponytail and you could say internet, then maybe you got some investment. Um, and we actually create programs in a spectrum. One of our, one of our sort of clients to help design this is the Volkswagen Academy because in the, in the company as big as that, they actually have an infrastructure and what we do with them is create programs that deal with assessing where their 250 some AI experts within the group are, calibrating them and then having them invest with professional development to have us, not only us, but we're one of the leading groups, provide some kind of interaction, skilling, skilling tests and up, upskills, so that's what this says. Um, how many people, I, the, so this is um, how an academic learns. I used to go to this tailor in Hong Kong because I was in that Hong Kong a lot. And it was, they, they always said they were bespoke tailors, right? And I didn't know what bespoke meant until I saw it in the educational part. So we do design curricula specifically for clients. That's another part of Amy Educates. And remember that this is the educational arm of a not-for-profit company. It's not the university only. They coordinate that spectrum of things, micro-credentials and all of that kind of stuff. And the Amy Connect is partly why I'm here now, is that the, the Amy group and its CEO um, trust me enough to not say things that are too controversial or wacky, to come out and try to talk to people. So for example, last year, Bruce and I we're part of a team that did similar kinds of workshops and presentations in five Asian cities. But I'm much more familiar with Asia and Europe than I am with the United States, only because those are places that I've lived and worked. But that's another thing that you can hear from people. In, in the last case, in which it, what is familiar to almost all organizations that think they have a trajectory of value coming from research, is to build around them industrial consortia that are willing to open their kimono just enough to participate in a consortia and lay their problems on the table. So here's an anecdote that explains this, is that working with both Toyota Corporation in, in Japan, I used to live in Tokyo, and was a professor at the University of Tokyo and lots of connections there, and with the Volkswagen Group in Germany, is they want to talk to each other about how they set priorities of investment and exploit return on investment for AI, but they can't talk to each other directly. So they, they ask me, because I know both groups, to say, Randy, could you arrange a meeting to do this and this kind of stuff? Because they want to compare in a consortia, they want to compare at least face value priorities and where they invest in AI. So for example, it wouldn't be a surprise to clever investors that Toyota and Volkswagen do not put all of their AI eggs into the self-driving basket. That's simply not the case. Um, if you think that is, then you've watched too many Tesla and Waymo commercials, is the Canadian's view. Going. Um, but what they do is they want, and I said to one of my colleagues, why would Volkswagen and Toyota trust me to do this? And the immediate answer from a, from a serious businessman who said, well, Randy, you're not about to steal their IDs and start building cars. Okay? I'm not going to do that. I can't even put together a model car. But that's the idea of uh, Amy Innovates, is getting together a consortia. We have 17 members now, and that will give you some idea about this, and this is just the, these are just the texts associated with the fancy graphics that say that. So that's 
that's the summary of that not-for-profit company and its four pillars and how it's trying to connect. What I'll do after a few more discussions on the program that uh, Jimmy is managing, tell you something about what is really exciting for me, because given my experience, I believe I can see line of sight to the edges and the frontiers of our AI research that hold amazing potential. It's sort of like you haven't seen anything yet when you talk to an AI scientist about what's possible. So I'll tell you something about that, but maybe if there are time for questions, however Jimmy wants to orchestrate that, I'll stop here. I think you can ask uh, Dr. Gable any questions right now. <laughs> and if you can find Dr. Gable, let me know where he is. Right now I'm Randy, so. So I saw people nodding and I saw people hearing uh, who has some questions. I get better, I'm like, remember the, that dark cloud in a science fiction movie? Nobody can get rid of them, they fire missiles at it and every time you hit it, it gets stronger. I'm that dark cloud, so. The more critical you are, the better I get. Yes. So you think we're gonna catch up with China and AI? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but the, the, I, I, the, so don't, the, excuse me for being glib, is, is that, um, remember that our ranking is about scientific productivity. It's not about, it's not about industrial exploitation. As far as I'm concerned, AI is useless unless you use it for something. And so the, the question really has to be about how clever can you be at exploiting what you see as the next opportunity from AI to be able to have positive <clears throat> impact? Now, it's, it's not a surprise, and it's a very old story that many Americans who leave the United States to come to Canada, and many Canadians like me, so I was offered jobs at Google and Carnegie Mellon, for example, chose not to move to the United States for one reason, is, is we don't want to work on the dual uses of AI, so I don't want to work on military projects, for example. But that's, that's a personal choice, it's got nothing, it's a philosophy, right? The question is, how can we take advantage of positive applications of AI? And I don't think that the, the jury isn't out. My glib answer about, no, we can't catch up, catch up with China, is, is really a perspective on what is it that we want to have impact about? I think that's what the AI scientist sees. Um, so I don't want to replicate humans, but I want to make the best damn use of humans I can by enabling them, like precision health is an area which is rich for opportunity. And the health science infrastructure in Europe and North America is still stronger than China. But if we don't focus on that, we will fall behind there, for example. That's just one example. So does that help give you context for your question? So we just have to pick our battles, essentially? Hmm? We just have to pick our battles, essentially? We're not going to catch up in everything? Yeah, that's right. Yes, exactly right. We won't, we won't catch up or be ahead in everything, but then um, nobody can, right? It's you said no military project. How about national security project? That's a good question because mm -hmm. as a Canadian, I have a great deal of difficulty separating security from offense, especially from the United States. Um, so, so we hear a lot about security and the notion of security is, is sometimes, um, it, it sometimes overlaps, right? So for example, the, here, here's a caricature of four countries in the world that gather the most data on its citizens and everybody else. Right? And two of them may surprise you. These are, these, this is summaries from computer scientists looking at how data is stored and captured, and it's a fragment of it because we only see, so if you think of private companies, um, public institutions, and government institutions, we have very little line of sight to government <coughs> data capture. But we know that China, the United States, and the two surprises for me were Israel and Saudi Arabia lead the world in gathering information about you and you and you. And the, que and the question is about dual use. Um, how much about you and me does the jurisdiction I'm living in know about me to make my life happier or miserable? Um, and that's really the question. There are some really interesting NGOs doing work on so-called, this one called Open Data Barometer, for example. So the Open Data Barometer is a non-governmental organization that assesses the ease of getting data uh, that's collected about people. 
right? And, and um, you might not be surprised to know that China and US aren't at the top of that list. But that's okay, right? It's, it's, it's a kind of measurement. So your question exposes this, big, this bigger question about what does security mean? So in principle, if I'm installing infrastructure to distinguish you and me walking down the street 14 kilometers away, and you're jaywalking and I'm not, we hope it's accurate, right? Because I don't want your jaywalking ticket, you don't want mine, right? Uh, but, but it's the degree of the impact. Um, the, I was at a legal reasoning conference. I do lots of work in legal reasoning. Um, I, what day is today? Wednesday? Monday. Giving a talk on legal informatics processing. And there was a debate about this American woman lobbyist who's saying that the federal government should regulate against face recognition because it, the face recognition AI does best on recognizing old white men. That's the most ludicrous thing I've heard ever. <laughs> It's the, it's the craziest thing. I can train an AI system to recognize everybody that looks like you and approximately those that look like you. I can also train one with this room as a sample and make it accurate enough to distinguish um, the old balding guy from the young blonde woman. So those systems can be built, right? This AI pandemic is creating this incredible lobby of articulate, uninformed people saying we have to regulate AI. Right? So there was a recommendation in a Canadian document that said, let's make sure that all AI systems are open source. Is that going to help? When was the last time any of you read source code to try to determine whether uh, a system, AI or not, right, was doing something um, nefarious? Most people in this room couldn't do it anyway, right? including me. So the question is very well positioned, but it's way more complicated than, than what we read in the public media. I think <clears throat> what we'll do right now, sorry, did I cut you off? No, no. Good. You have to. I'm a professor. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know there's more questions. I know you a question here and question here. Um, we're going to take a quick five, ten minutes, um, just so people, if you need to use the uh, restroom, just help the doors and